All right, guys, welcome to homeschool uh, week two. I guess this will be day seven of everything. All right, you guys got to let me know how this is going. I got to give a few shout outs. I talked to Caroline and Sammy. We're trying to figure out a way to do a, a Google Meet. Um, Yael is the first one to sign up for the Google Classroom. And then I just uh, had to, uh, a nice little chat with um, Griffin. Trying to figure out the best way to go forward. I get it, you guys are seniors. We're kind of in this limbo. You know, are we giving grades? Are we not? This is an, an elective class, but I want to at least keep going for those who want to check out the content. This is some good stuff you guys are going to be able to use later on in your academic career. So I know it's not great. Um, we're here in my garage. I thought it would help to see me as I get blinded by all these lights. Or if you just want me to stand behind the camera and talk just filming the screen. Those are all things that I could use. So keep an eye out. I'm going to start putting out like question sheets to see if you guys are watching these. If you need the PowerPoints, I guess I could always um, do that as well. Just kind of give me some feedback to know how we are doing here. So we're in the middle of the year. 1943. You know, we in 42 we had the Great Battle of Stalingrad, and we invaded in North Africa. And then there's you know Midway and Guadalcanal, and then you know New Britain and the Bismarck Sea. And the Marines just finished the nasty Battle of Tarawa yesterday. And now we're going to go back to the European theater to Operation Shingle, the invasion of Sicily. By the way, I may stop abruptly at about 20, 25 minutes. We were told in a faculty meeting today that less is more. So that's where I'm going to try and keep it. So what we have here is the Italian Peninsula. And down here all right, is the great invasion of Sicily with Bernard Law Montgomery coming up the coast road and then George Patton's um, run across Sicily. Now the problem is, once again, Patton will smack the helmet off the head of the GI suffering from post-traumatic post -traumatic stress syndrome. And that's going to have a reciprocal effect as we go into Italy here. So many of the Germans were able to escape across the Strait of Messina and now they are in mainland Italy. So the plan is for the United States Army to land in Salerno and over here around Bari the British 8th Army is going to land, and we're going to go up the Italian peninsula. Now, down the middle are the Apennine Mountains, kind of the spinal column of Italy. But on either side are these broad, flat plains, the great Italian farming country, which should give access to our speed and our mobility, enabling us to get up to Rome. Most people are talking about getting to Rome by the end of the year, right? This, this whole Thanksgiving, Christmas, 1943. But what the Germans are going to do is they're going to build this thing known as the Gustav Line. It is at the end of the Leary Valley, about 90 miles from Rome. And Rome is on everybody's mind. It's this ancient capital. There's you know, Vatican City there. There are these priceless works of art. There is, you know, architectural structures like the Colosseum and, you know, the ancient Roman aqueducts. Do we want the German army to destroy those in their retreat? Also at this time, Italy is still an ally of Adolf Hitler. And so the problem is going to be getting up there. It is going to be one of Hitler's henchmen, a guy named Albrecht Kesselring, who was a famous World War I pilot. He was a, took over the Flying Circus, um, the British fighter pilots, after the Red Baron, that is going to say, no, I'm not going to make this easy. Instead of retreating all the way up here into our territory, we are going to fall back hilltop to hilltop. We're going to, if they want to come, that's okay, but we are going to bleed them. We're going to make them suffer. Italy is perfect for defensive terrain. And so the Germans are going to put their 88 millimeter cannons and a couple MG-34, MG-42 machine guns in every mountaintop. And if they get overrun and they get pushed back, they'll fall back a half a mile or a mile to the next mountain plateau. 
And they will have pre-sighted. So as we occupy the defenses that we just shoved them out of, they're going to drop the famous 88 millimeter artillery right on top of us. Everything was pre-measured and thought out. They're going to fall back very similar to the way we talked about um, when Grant, you know, decides to um, attack Battle of Missionary Ridge, that those escarpments that William Sherman's men had, had to clamber over mountain after mountain after mountain. That's going to happen here in Italy. And the whole thing is going to turn out to be uh, kind of a, a mess. So it's July 1943. It's the summer. We've just captured Sicily, and now it's going to be on going on into Italy. And we think, again, this is going to be done by Thanksgiving or Christmas, but it'll take until June of the next year, almost a full year, for the Italian peninsula to be captured. Now, as we land, um, Italian leader Benito, Benito Mussolini is going to be overthrown. All right, July 25th, 1943, the fascist leader of Italy is done. And the Allies want to really take advantage of this change in government. They want to, you know, get in there, make a deep penetration, and capture a lot of ground before Germany has a chance to react, before they can send reinforcements down to the peninsula. Problem is, the surrender negotiation, again, Italy, the great flip-floppers, right? They are bandwagon riders. Whoever is winning, that's the side they are on. The negotiations go slow, and this allows the Germans to bring in 12 divi divisions, each division having about 20,000 men. So they're getting a ton of reinforcements here. And what the Germans want to do is keep the Allies way down in the south, and the ankle and the toe in the heel of, of the boot. Because if we go back to the map, once we make landfall here, we can now go up over the Alps and begin to bomb southern Germany, like the big southern German capital of Munich. And Winston Churchill has always been in favor of this, right? He calls it the soft underbelly of Europe, getting at Germany from the bottom. Well, the problem is, up in here, the Italian and the Austrian Alps are so rugged, there's no way this is going to be practical. Because if the Germans get in trouble, all they have to do is cause an avalanche and block the road. There's like one good road today called the Brenner Pass coming out of Innsbruck, coming on down towards Italy. So this is, you know, the soft underbelly. You're going to have to go over to, to France because going straight up through the Alps is not going to work. But our planes, the 17th Air Force, is going to be able to bomb them directly. So here it is. Um, the uh, 8th of September, excuse me, I kind of got sidetracked for a second, the Italian army is going to sign an armistice. And as that happens, we land, the United States lands in um, Salerno, south of the big port city of Naples. And our goal is to rapidly shoot up the coast and capture Naples, you know, this massive, you know, port city, and then once we've got Naples on one side and Brie on the other, it'll be a sprint up the sidelines right to the end zone, which we think is going to be Rome. Problem here is going to be leadership. This is General Mark Clark. Not a bad guy, but you know, I'm not so much of a fan, my personal opinion. He's going to lead the United States 5th Army from the West. And the problem here, as you can see, Bernard Law Montgomery is going to land with the British 8th Army in Bury. And the problem is, right at this moment in time, all the prime time veteran commanders, the guys who have been in charge, are going to be pulled out of Italy and sent to London to begin to plan for the D-Day invasion. Right? D-Day is just barely a conceivable idea. It's going to be about 18 months to, to two years of, of planning. So Eisenhower, Omar Bradley, Bernard Law Montgomery, all these veteran guys of North Africa and Sicily are going to be pulled out. And in their place is going to be their subordinate commanders, not guys who are bad, but guiding an, an army and being in total charge 
is different than being a subordinate. You know, it's the difference between being like a head coach, I hate to go sports analogy here, a head coach and an offensive or a defensive coordinator. Some guys can handle the job and some guys can't. And this makes the removal of Patton even more devastating. Now, it's, it's a what-if game, and we will never know what would happen if Patton was put in charge, but we're about to have a lot of problems as a result. So we have this JV squadron of military leaders taking over while Italy is just in complete and total chaos. The Italians don't know what to do. It takes a while for the word to trickle down, so some are disarmed. The Germans can't trust them. Many of them are just shot. Some still want to fight for um, Germany, so nobody knows what's going on, and all of a sudden, there are 650,000 Italian soldiers who are now prisoners of war going, pray to God, say, hey, I thought I was fighting with you, and now I'm, I'm doing something different. What the heck is, is, is going on? And the Germans have to take care of all of these prisoners, and then the people are going to be trapped in the middle. So on September 9th, we land at Salerno, and what should be easy is once again a difficult process. We're able to land and get small individual beachheads. All right? Problem is there isn't a lot of American or British air support, and around them are Panzer tank divisions. And all of a the sudden, they began steamrolling and attacking down the different roads and valleys right towards the coastline. And the American army is looking like they're going to get pushed back into the water. Like it's the Gulf of Gala all over again. Like, wait a minute, we thought we would have air cover. We, you know, we're just foot soldiers with M1s and grenades. How do we take on tanks? Well, looking around, the only reserve element is the 82nd Airborne. And they're like, wait a minute. The last time you guys sent us in, your pilots panicked. We were dropped from Sicily into the Mediterranean Sea on mainland Italy. You know, we are not cannon fodder. Last time we were forced to stop German tanks all by ourselves. Is that going to happen again? And the answer was no. No, we got you. Well, the 82nd Airborne, not the full, you know, unit, but a couple divisions are, are flown in. And once again, it is the ingenuity and the tenacity of the 82nd Airborne and their leader, Jim James Gavin, that is able to blow up um, roadblocks, um, cause avalanches, do everything they can to slow down the Panzer tanks while they're waiting for the American Army to come on up, the land-based foot soldiers. Like, come on, man, come and, and help us out. And when they're in dire straits, it is the Navy. The Navy comes in, and it's a massive naval barrage that is able to lay down a blanket of um, cover. It causes widespread destruction in the towns and in the countryside, but it does force the Germans back. So all of this is going to take about two weeks. And on September 20th, the British 8th Army is going to land on Marie on the East Coast. And just by twist of fate or however it worked, while the Salerno is heavily defended, the British are able to come ashore with little opposition. Not no opposition, but not much. And so in their mindset is, oh, but you got see, it's Italy. You got the beautiful Italian sunshine, the great food, the great wine. Why hurry up? Man, after being in North Africa and Sicily, this place is great. So there's really no pep in their step to really drive forward and get going. And so it's going to take a long time, but eventually the U.S. and the British are going to link up. In their delay, again, they're supposed to be, you know, a third of the way to Rome by now, the Germans dig into the mountains. Here's where Kesselring begins building those defenses. And by October, by the end of September, a bitter, bitter, nasty campaign is going to start. And being in Italy is great in the summer. But in the fall, the rains begin to come. It saturates the ground. It causes flash floods, and it makes things much different. So you can see here some of the you know Italian kids. They're playing around like stacked uh, um, mortar shells, like the ones I showed you in, in my World War One um, presentation. And you can see all the blown out buildings over here. 
While the Tommies, they come ashore on the eastern side, they're sitting down as usual, brewing, brewing up their tea, getting their tea in, you know, spitzball, cheerio, man. This here is you know, pretty good as a military campaign can get, you know, God save the queen and all that. Tea time, you know, 3.30. And so you've got, you know, chaos on one side and a relatively, you know, easy time on the other side. I'm not going to hurry up. And so during this time, uh, the Germans will construct the Gustav Line. And this is going to cause two months of nasty, brutal, and bitter fighting. And trapped in the middle are the poor Italian civilians. You know, we're trying to give food, we're trying to give medical aid. The Italians don't know who to trust. If we get pushed out, the Germans are going to come back. So what do you do? And in the meantime, all right, this, you know, the rain begins to come in and it softens the deep, thick, rich volcanic soil. And the Germans are great engineers and as they retreat, they mine different roads. So as our tanks and vehicles are going down the roads, they start hitting landmines and getting blown up, causing us to deviate to go into, you know, the dirt. Well, this is a tank, you know, a, you know this tank will go right through that field. Well... The Germans learned how to flood the marshlands, to turn them into swamps, but to camouflage them. And what they were very good at is taking a lot of the peat, a lot of the, the, the decayed like flesh and leaves from the bottom of swamps in this great, you know, naturally thick volcanic soil. And if you can look here, I'm going to get to my little prop closet. I got here a little half bottle of water. I go into my little prop station here. The Germans got a hold of, you know, peat moss. And peat moss is dirt. It comes from the bottom of swamps. But if you will see, if you put it in water, it floats. So if you put enough of these hunks of peat in there, in this water, it looks like dirt is going to be covering, you know, this field. But underneath it is a swamp or is a, is a pond or is a small river. And as our tanks go in and drive over this peat, that's a couple inches deep on the top, floating on the water. Boop, 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 boop. They quickly sink. And so with the mines and with the different, you know, peat, we might as well throw some more in here and see, you know, uh, how much we can get in here. So you can still see, and you can see there is, you know, the water, and there is the peat floating on top. It was brilliant camouflage that we gave the Germans time to erect and have ready. So now, what are we going to do? And this slows down the whole operation. And so now it looks like, well, we're going to be there by Thanksgiving. Maybe, maybe not so much. So, <clears throat> that is problem number one. And so the United States Army is first to go old school, like they're in the Civil War. Not a whole lot of horses around, but they're forced to conscript and grab donkeys and mules to drag equipment through. We're not, no longer using jeeps or our two and a half ton trucks. It's, it's a foot soldier's war. This becomes an infantryman's war as we keep crawling up the coast in the mountains heading into the nasty Leary Valley. And it's here that Stars and Stripes cartoonist, a guy named Bill Malden, comes up with two fantastic characters. And their names are Willie and Joe. They're kind of reminiscent of, of Chip and Dale can only tell them apart from their noses. And Willie and Joe is, you know, satire on the conditions on the front lines. A lot of officers like George Patton hated Willie and Joe, but the men absolutely loved him. So here is a German tank, if you can see, and sitting in a foxhole is Willie and Joe. And the caption is, um, yeah, I'm sure, you know, you know, Germans are around. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm positive as the, the artillerymen are, are you sure we're not wasting any rounds? Are you sure there are Germans? And they're down here underneath them going pretty um, daggone sure. And here he says, you know, don't, don't do it, Joe, as he's got his Tommy gun pointed on this, you know, German soldier. He was like, don't do it. The bottle's almost full. The Germans retreating, carrying a, um, a bottle of wine, some of the few creature comforts the guys had on their flight up through, through Italy. So if you ever see some William and Joe cartoons, um, check them out. They are um, fabulous. And then here's my favorite one. They're in the mountains. 
And here is, you know, um, Willie bringing Joe down and says, I calls her Florence Nightingale. This was the way the transportation was, how wounded was brought out. They had to do it on donkey and mule rather than by jeep and um, ambulance. So, slowly but surely, we are trying to move forward. And we haven't gotten there by Halloween. We haven't gotten there by Thanksgiving. Things were not going well. And the Germans are actually going to come up with a little bit of propaganda. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. They began to drop these leaflets. And what it was, was the distance um, that the armies had made. And in the bottom, the other part of the legend, is how far a snail had traveled. In the same amount of time the Allies went 180 kilometers, whatever distance that is, a snail would be able to go 320. So, you know, the snail's pace is faster than us being able to go up the Italian um, peninsula. And so Mark Clark creates this idea to um, break the stalemate. Well, we're coming from the south up the Italian peninsula. He wants an amphibious landing to land behind them. And they're going to land at Anzio Beach, and we're going to go inland, and we are going to trap the Germans. We're going to get behind their stop defenses. The idea is to get behind the famous German 10th Army. Right? These are some of the best troops that Germany has left, and they're falling back mountain to mountain with those pre-sighted defenses that I, I told you about. And so United States General John Lucas is going to conduct this amphibious landing behind them, the combination of American and British units. Americans in the south and British up in front. And so on January, January 22nd, we've now gone into 1944, 370 ships hit the beach. The problem was, and here is the, the junior commanders, the objective wasn't extremely clear. We were not supposed to sit on the beach and dig in, but hit the beach and dig, you know, move inland. Don't dig in, get up into the mountains and block the mountain passes so the German tanks couldn't come down. Well, as people are trying to figure this out, soldiers do their job, they start digging their foxholes and they set up for the night. And it just so happens that our own, you know, C, Mr. C. Charles Webb's grandfather, or excuse me, father-in-law, Leroy, was here. And Leroy was manning a 30 caliber machine gun into the next foxhole from him, started the British Army. And he looks over, and there are these two British guys, and they got their tea kit out in there, and they're brewing their tea. And he's like, guys, where are your guns? You know, I, I see you're, you're um, brewing your tea, but what if the Germans come? Like, oh, you know... You know, mate, oh, you know, don't worry about it, we're just brewing up our tea. We can't get our guns. Our kit is back on a supply barge. So an infantryman's lifeline is his primary weapon, his rifle. You never go anywhere without your rifle. Well, with British organization, you're going to get on one boat and you're going to stack your rifle on the other. So they're on land with nothing to fight with. And unfortunately, the next day, German tanks come out of the mountains down onto the floodplain of the beach. And they begin to encircle everyone. And Leroy was shooting, he said, until a tank comes up over a sand dune and lowers his 88 millimeter cannon at him. And Leroy said, well, you know, uh, time's up. He was forced to surrender and will spend the rest of the war in a prisoner of war camp. And man, he was not so happy about his neighbor allies without their um, rifles. And so, as the Germans come down to um, Anzio Beach, this brilliantly conceived but poorly executed plan falls apart. And so by February, the soldiers are driven back to the, the beach. Once again, the Navy has to come in. And thank goodness that the um, German and the Italian Navy was pretty much done in the Mediterranean by this point, and that the Luftwaffe is not able to, to give the Royal and American Army Air Force a, a fight here. So it's a nasty war of attrition between British, American, and German soldiers. 
The NGO campaign will cost 43,000 United States casualties and 40,000 German casualties. So ANZIO doesn't work. In a weird analogy, it's like World War I, where the French were in Verdun and the British try to attack on the Somme to relieve them, and the French have to resume the attack back in Verdun again. Well, that's the exact same thing that happens. And so we're going to start tomorrow with a famous battle of Monte Cassino on this, you know, mountain fortress on a 1,100 tall foot mountain right at the top of the Leary Valley, the commanding section where Benedict of Nerissa um, built the oldest European monastery in 529, the, the writer of, of the Benedictine order of monks. So we're going to pick up with round two tomorrow. It's been about 20 minutes, as we were told, less is more. Battle of Monte Cassino coming up tomorrow, and that'll be the last one for the week.